Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our week three um, and also to our second session uh, online um, to support you in you developing a, a load pedagogy. Obviously load pedagogy uh, doesn't apply just to languages other than English, it also applies to English uh, uh, language teaching and obviously in Australia there will be a place for you not just in in the load area of your schools but also to support teachers and uh, take leadership in providing um, bridging programs and providing support to students from different language backgrounds because we have many of them in Australia. Now one thing I wanted to say is that as you have actually gathered and some of you uh, might have um, not find it so new, but some of you do. So as you have covered, um, there are two ways of actually approaching English, teach, uh, English and other languages, other and languages other than English, uh, in your classrooms. One of them is obviously to use a book, someone else's textbook, someone produces the book, and you just follow it. Uh, that's the way to actually continue contributing to the state in Australia where we have this philosophy that no English person can learn another language and it is only them, those, those others who can learn English. So why don't we just stay that way? Languages are boring and all of that. So that pedagogy doesn't actually help us to keep our jobs. So that's the first thing. So in the in the in in the in those in this in, in this semester what i want to do is with students who actually meet me for the first time to actually learn another way and students who work with me already second semester i would like us to actually continue polishing and reflecting on what we've done in semester one um so that you can actually feel more free and a bit more convinced um and at ease with the way of teaching which is actually not reducing language to words and grammar and also not uh, reducing language to a yet another memory game where students have to memorize things they find it really difficult and teachers make it increasingly easier for them today we will just learn you know this week we will learn just 10 words or something i will show you a video that says Every time you believe that learning is helped when you make things easier for the students, you are wrong, right? You are wrong. The less you give them, the harder it gets. So that's the guy. What's his name? His name is Berg, uh, Robert Bjork, sorry. Robert Bjork, so he's from UCLA. And this is a lovely video that I strongly uh, recommend that you actually watch it if you watch anything in this semester do watch this how we learn versus how we think we learn right so obviously you can straight away see that he will actually debunk a lot of beliefs um and also what he says in this video uh, lecture what he says that very often we create stories about how we learn oh this is how i learn best and in fact his research has shown that what we say we do you know what's good for us and how we learn the best it's actually wrong actually we don't know we don't know how we learn and that's actually quite interesting there's another lecture i think here uh, so forgetting forgetting as a friend of learning right so we want our students to remember everything but what he says that forgetting is a friend of learning so that's that's a real nice lecture too you might watch it he gave it at Harvard so Harvard University has here this one on its channel so please do watch it I actually have a paper he does research with his wife so I have a paper myself uh, created by here a team of his wife and two more people um, so I might actually um, upload it together with the link to this video so you can actually have it too if you want to so certainly in those lectures you will find a few truism or what I don't know a few truths a few uh, for example that knowledge is not reproduction right none of us actually when learning is not reproduction so you can't keep if you give people stuff to memorize and give it back to you you're not actually supporting them to learn you're just going through the hoops right and you're hoping that somehow this semester will end they will reproduce something and we'll all move on 
as I said, that doesn't help the cause of load, nor does it help actually us to keep our jobs. So the idea continuously through these four slides I want to show you, uh, the idea is continuously nobody knows what are the building blocks of knowledge. We can say that there are some particular things that the brain does particular things, but how it all works and what's required, nobody really knows. So putting the teacher in, in control as if he or she uh, knew the path to the rising sun, so, so to speak, is actually a mistake. So we have other traditions. What do we say? If knowledge is construction, right? What are the building blocks? Again, the same problem. No, knowledge is actually not construction, it's reconstruction, but that's another story. So basically people like you have been exposed to, say, people like Vygotsky uh, and a lot of education, say 90% of, edu of educators are saying, oh, Vygotsky is the, is, is the game in town, right? Well, no, it is in terms that people say that. But what Vygotsky does is exactly the same thing as I spoke about before. Vygotsky puts uh, the teacher in an expert position, right? The teacher knows how to actually dialogize. Well, actually, dialogue, ter the term dialogue is not explained by Vygotsky. But anyway, the idea is that through, through language, uh, the teacher will somehow lead the student to the uh, required skills, right? Um, as, if, as if teacher knew. I mean, you know, as, as if anyone knew, that's the first thing, which as if anyone knew what is it that we need to do for students to achieve their goals. I mean, nobody, nobody knows what's in people's brains and how their brain functions to that degree so that we could actually do that, let alone, um, you know, sell the story that teachers do. So that's the first problem. And the second problem I wanted to mention is that... Um, you know, the idea to suggest that language is a sense, I, I, it's fine, I, and I suggest it simply, simply because it's not a stupid idea, but also that in language teaching we very often forget that we are multisensory beings, and there somewhere in your modules you have my paper where I actually do talk about multisensory learning. So the idea is that if we actually, like in the Vygotsky context, people put this expert teacher who will, uh, through by explaining and by play, not playing, because play is actually quite misunderstood in that context, but by dialogizing, by talking to the student, somehow the student will, through language, um, achieve the understandings required. Well, I don't know how the teacher does the pronunciation of French or of, or of Indonesian or through language. Really, it's really hard for me to understand it. So, and it's not just pronunciation, right? When we actually deal with culture and with emotions and um, there are many senses involved in processing information. We are not single sensory people. And Vygotsky had this idea of language, but that was 1926, he could. He could because it was back then. But for me, a, a person who's in the 21st century, picking up one sense or one channel as the channel through which everything happens, it's really not just reductionary. It's actually bad theory. It's just bad, bad theorizing, leading to bad practice. So we know we are multisensory. We know that information comes to us through different holes in our body and through different channels, including skin. And you know it when you go to the disco when the waves hit your skin and you feel like, you know, dancing, because that's that's just a, um, that's that that's that, that's what skin is one of the channels through which we actually sense vibration of the uh, of the world around us. So through different channels, information comes to our brain, there gets processed, and then we think we just felt something or smelled something or we heard something. We can say, oh, it smells bad, or I, I think it. Um, um, sounds like you said language is a sense that's what i understood right and you understood it because a lot of processing multisensory processing got actually happened in your brain and then you actually had the sensation that you heard me and you heard me say this so it's it's it, we are multisensory and we need to actually create situations whereby we don't teach through language we actually teach through as playful activities as possible with lots of diverse tools that allow students to actually expand or work with their various senses so that they can utilize this multi-channel information to help them perceive how to act 
or how to how to be in another language. Right, so we're multisensory, and I really wanted to spend the 10 minutes or whatever I've done so far to actually make this point. Some of you uh, had been with me for a while. I just wanted to say that uh, last November I went to Vietnam um, and I gave these uh, eight weeks, eight, eight days of consultancy on computer assisted language learning. And what uh, Vietnam has done, it has received some funding and is, is now teaching all language teachers how to use technology to support language learning. This is some slide, I just, I did not slide, this is just something I have pulled out from some of the paperwork that uh, came to me um, so that I could use it in one way or another during my uh, lectures. I wanted you to know that, that, that countries like Vietnam and countries in the Asian uh, community recognize language languages as a wealth and recognize language teaching as important and especially recognize the use of technology because not only because technology is important and it's everywhere but also as i said probably in my previous lecture we live in a resource-based era we have resources everywhere but most people don't know how to find them uh, and you know, wherever they're there, how to find them and then how to work with them. So basically, everybody's of, well, look, this discourse was already in the 20th century, but it's getting pretty much uh, more traction nowadays. So we're shifting towards a resource based learning, project based learning, focus on gathering and creating resources, gathering and creating resources. So no longer a single textbook, right? Um, so we're focusing on gathering and creating resources and tools to assist students in making sense of the world through English, because I was teaching uh, English teachers, but through um, Right, so basically, we, we, the reason why I'll be focusing so much on technology, it's because we're no longer in a, um, you know, 1500s, when uh, books cost as much as a, you know, as a half of a castle. Having a book was the same as having a house. And there was only one for um, the whole country on a particular, you know, with a particular title. We're not living in a culture like this, but we're behaving as if we did. So there's this technology and all of that, but we don't know how to use it in classroom. We don't know why we would be, since we have this perfect textbook, but we can give it to the 16 children in our classroom and we can just follow it diligently. It's not the world of today. Now, there's another thing, not only that technology will give, give our students tools and, and, and resources to actually engage their senses and um, help them to engage in load learning in a more individual, individualized and also entertaining and, and interesting way. It also is good for teachers because once you gather, and I will be showing it, once you gather those resources, once you actually identify the tools that allow, that give students this independence, what happens? You can actually use them year in and year out. Not like a textbook, because textbook was to memorize the same activities and the same thing. This is now you're creating a thing like a repository, a database of stuff that allows students to cruise through it and play with it and find information from it. So the environment becomes richer. It's entertaining for you because it's amazing to create stuff like this. It's actually quite satisfactory, but it also creates quite a rich, inform um, information rich environment for students and is in step with the requirements of the Australian curriculum. So here it is, the thing I was using in my um, lectures in Vietnam, stagnation is not an option. This is something I stole from one of our students. I gather it could have been a, a literacy student uh, who produced this in, as part of their assignment. And normally I actually, I actually name the student, but I just can't find yet. I just couldn't today find from what student, who's, what um, the name of the student from whom I actually took this slide. But look at this, how, how beautiful it is. It's all about making connections, right? So we have, so even when, if you teach English literacy, right, uh, to, primary, to primary students, you should use languages. Look at this diversity. There's an environment, there's text, there's the world around, there are signs everywhere. There, the world is bigger than we thought. 
And then there is something else, I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? This is a picture of a barbecue making. So people do things, you know, people just have their normal lives. So it's about making connections. And I think that's exactly what the curriculum, Australian curriculum actually says. It, so uh, the idea that if you teach Italian, you can't have actually indigenous uh, connection in, in your curriculum, that's, an, uh, that's ab absolutely um, off, tr off track because we know that people in Italy do speak about Australia and you can't speak about uh, Australia without actually mentioning indigenous people and so on. So people, if students study Italian, they talk about lots of things. So there, I just wanted to say that. I also wanted to say this, and some of you actually are quite uh, now um, across the fact that I, I do teach how to actually analyze, enter, the te enter text through emotions. And I want you to actually uh, get a bit more uh, um, Oh, uh, and or fair with it, kind of like um, appreciate it and start actually uh, testing this. And also, you know, there's plenty of resources everywhere. So one of our students last semester put this into their thing. Um, then there is stuff out there, right? So you will be creating your portfolios later on. And I mean, there's a lot of things out there. So like, like for example, those, those lectures in neuroscience about learning and so on. So I will want you to um, look for your materials and for uh, interest and for inspiration to teach loud, not just from a textbook, as I said before, and I follow this and I do the things that people did in the past, but I want you to actually explore the net. So that's maybe towards the second assignment, but more. Now, uh, whether, whether this video is being used by students uh, from the ECM 251 or 252, um, I will use some of our uh, presentations from uh, our former students or from earlier semesters so that we could actually start reflecting on how we can improve uh, our delivery. So for ECM 252 students, what I would like to stress, but it's not that 14-year-old has different learn language learning needs than a 10-year-old. There's no difference in... in there will be differences in terms of resources they will be using, so that resources will be probably a bit more for teenagers for, uh, of a different quality in terms of a sophistication and complexity, but pedagogy is the same. So here's my point I wanted to make. I have just spent 15 minutes talking about complexity as being actually the factor that not only uh, supports learning, like this uh, professor in neuroscience and or psychology discusses, so complexity and challenge, all the things that actually run counter to our old beliefs, right? So simple is bad, um, complex is good. Allowing students time to forget is really good making sure that we test them as soon, as soon as they just learn stuff is really bad for learning. So complexity matters. But also complexity, and, and now just probably not in addition to, but just probably because what this guy from psychology, the psychologist, what's professor, what he's saying is actually supported by the things that I also have found out in neuroscience, which is, and I just spoke about, if we are, multi-sensory beings, if you make a learning context simple, what happens, you prevent students from engaging their senses in more than one way. So play is not an F, a good environment because it is like a mother with a child. That's, that's not what it is, right? Play is good, especially in a rich environment with many tools. It's because children can actually engage their many senses and test and contest their perspectives on how the world or how things function, right? So if we say that complex matters because it not only supports learning, but it also enables students to engage their many senses, then when I say this, I actually mean it. Well, what does that mean, Anya? Well, what that means is 
that when we start creating our teaching plans, we cannot create a teaching plan around something simple. And I have spoken about it last time when we had this class, when I put it on YouTube, when I said that from my French classes, when we started simple, I only today remembered the first sentence we learned. It, we, because my whole brain opened and that's all I got. I memorized it, the rest I don't remember, but that thing I remember. So um, we don't start with the simple, we start with the complex. So I have taken the lesson designed by one of our students and on purpose because I will be analyzing every time we meet, I will be analyzing someone else's lesson and will be showing how this can be improved. And I would really like to see in your assignments um, a willingness to move forward. So what we have here in this class, so this is a teaching plan from another semester and it starts with the interact in classroom routines and activities. So this is a, so, so that's basically relationship to the curriculum. Now curric the curriculum, Australian curriculum for load doesn't say that. A student probably thinks that it does. Well, let me show you what, what the curriculum actually says, right? So we're just stopping right there. This is a very um, traditional way of working with the curriculum where people think, well, we have particular outcomes, so we'll teach each of them at a given time. But when you do it, you say curriculum is overcrowded because it's got so many. Well, let me show you now that the curriculum actually doesn't say that. So when we click on the learning outcome here, right, we will get to here. And indeed, what does it say? It says content description, content description, right? So we have using Vietnamese, so interact in classroom routines and activities by responding to questions, following instructions and asking for permission, which is exactly what our student actually has uh, created. So using Vietnamese for everyday classrooms and then responding to all of that, right? And you would think, well, what's wrong with that, Anya? We'll get rid of that. Because when we start looking elsewhere and we see more, right? Oh my goodness, there is socializing systems and then communicating, understanding. And then under each of those, we have stuff, right? So when we did the um, classroom activity thing, right? What happened to understanding and what happened to informing language variation and change? What happened there? We well, would say, well, that wasn't relevant. OK, so you could say that. Then we go to one step back and we have other languages, but we also have things like general capabilities and cross-curriculum priorities, and they're all part of the Australian curriculum language. So what do we do with that? You would say, well, that wasn't part of that lesson, but you cannot do that. You know, you just don't have a choice. You can't say, well, general capabilities I will do week 17, but week 10 I will do classroom introductions and week uh, three, I will do some other thing. This is not a supermarket, right? The curriculum is not a supermarket where you today pick sugar and tomorrow salt. You actually are baking the entire student. Each time you meet students, you, you're working with the entire student. You're not baking a cake and today I just, you know, need pepper and tomorrow I so that one day I'll create a cake. Every day, you are working with the entire student. That's the first thing. But So you have to actually, every time you're in classroom, you actually deal with the multiplicity of language components and learning components at the same time. 
because all of them are in place. When I talk to you, I'm thinking about emotions. I'm thinking, I'm selecting words. I'm selecting ideas. I'm selecting also ways of communicating that I think will not be terrifying you. I'm kind of threading the, uh, you know, um, here very uh, gently because uh, I know this is really new to you. So I don't want to um, terrify you, but I also don't want you to think that I actually think uh, doing small things and little steps is actually the way to go. And especially, you know, teacher being in a position of the um, conductor. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. Right. So um, every time students interact in the language, any language, all these things are in place. They have to be always aware they are part of the society. They have to be aware that they have to therefore make critical connect, uh, um, choices. And they actually, as they interact, they have to be self-aware, which is the social and, and personal capabilities where they're self-aware because the transformation, tra they are continuously in the process of transformation. Education is for transformation, right? So when students interact, it is not just simply, simply saying their name. Every interaction engages students' self-awareness awareness of themselves and also of others. So all these things are happening at the same time. And in real life, when you speak your native language, they also happen in a loud classroom. So we just can't say, I'm just doing this bit for this lesson. But what happened to general capabilities? What happened to the cross curriculum prayer? What happened to them? They're not even mentioned. And I would say, why? Do you have a choice? And you don't. So there you go. So there's a lot of stuff there in the curriculum. And in fact, if we go actually even deeper, right, because I've got it today. Like this is pages and pages, right? Um, so there are descriptions of different, of different aspects of the language curriculum. And then, so you read that, and I want you to read it because you will read it for you. I, I actually want you to spend time and find joy in reading this document, right? Joy. This is the only place where I'm actually not critical when I read that stuff. And I think, yeah, someone put it together. I'm so grateful they did it. I didn't have to do it. Right, read it. And you'll say, well, what does this have to do with my classroom, right? I do Vietnamese. Where were where indigenous people in your classroom? And you'd say, well, we were learning Vietnamese. So these are the things we need to actually think about. Uh, so there, and what do we have here, right? So we have communicating, explained how many things are involved, right? Socialize, obtain, process, interpret, convey information, respond and give expression to real imaginative experiences, mediate between languages and cultures, blah, 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 mediate. You know, my name is Anya Lyon. It's, I'm not really, am I mediating much? Am I aware of it, whether I'm mediating much? So for ex let's assume that I am mediating a lot, even when I just say my name is Anya Lyon. But how do you in that Vietnamese classroom actually make students aware of it, that they're mediating a number of language or of communication components and cultural components, even when they just say my name is Anya Lyon? So understanding all of that stuff, you know, how diverse technologies shape communication. OK, the power of language. Interesting. How many people in Australia speak English? How many of them speak indigenous languages? The power of language. And also how to how to use language in order to do all of these things. Obviously, the power of language is not in the vocabulary, as I mentioned before. It's in intentions and therefore it's in emotions. So emotions dictate what kind of structures we use, because depending on the emotion you use, you want to express or evoke in your interlocutor, you'll be using different structures. All of that, all of that reciprocating, right? There's so many things involved. If you were to create a lesson on, the, on each of those things, there wouldn't be enough days in the curriculum in a semester, right? on every outcome for a capability, on every, on every aspect of priorities, on every aspect of that, there wouldn't be enough room in your teaching classes. So there has to be a way to solve it. 
that actually doesn't turn any of those things as a single learning object, but in fact, what we need to do is to create complex environment that allows students to explore how the, all of these things work together. So even if we were to follow this lesson one as described in here, Right, so let's go, let's go through it because it gives us a pretty good idea uh, how to feel about it and maybe where we can actually make improvements. Right, so you can read it for yourselves and then we have the lesson here. Introduce the aim of the lesson. So who's doing the introduction? The teacher, right? The teacher says, today you people who are in my power because I hold your future in my little hand, you will be doing this and they go oh my goodness we will we'll trust you that this is going to be really good to us but it's it's the point that we're actually asking them to asking the student to delegate um uh their own power to us we tell them what's good for them we tell them this is the aim of the lesson this will be the steps these are the materials and you just do what we tell you one can do it one day three days maybe but one can't do it all their lives anyway so introduce the aim of the lesson so that we could be more innovative about this we really could be come up with a new vocabulary who says that vocabulary is actually the way to go I talk about emotions. Emotion is actually a, a, a component of language, but actually of communication, but actually dictates what kind of structures, not just vocabulary, but the entire chunks, structures that you will be using. Right? A much more powerful, in my view, um, approach to actually what students are learning and an element, much more powerful, uh, uh, pardon me, um, Emotions are much a much more powerful uh, organizing component of language than vocabulary, right? But why do we talk about vocabulary? Because maybe in the curriculum, mention, someone mentions the word vocabulary. Yes, but they are not pedagogues, right? We are pedagogues. We need to think a little bit more in an innovative way. And I have thought about it, and I will be teaching once again about the way we actually could use emotions as the organizing structure of text as opposed to vocabulary or grammar. So introduce the aim of a blah, blah, come up with vocabulary. Uh, so we want them to talk about personal profile, you know, hobby, family. Why those? Why those? And you'd say, well, what else, Anya? Well, it's very interesting, right? Why, why would we choose those? I'll just follow up with it, this question a little bit. Understanding about how to make and answer the question to introduce myself with this new vocabulary, right? So and a, explore the answer and learn how to make simple, or is he simple? Simple, this guy says, this guy from psychology says, learning is about starting with a complex. It's about, with, you know, big challenges. It's about making things difficult for the student, but we are still in the culture of making things simple. Practicing pairs, uh, more familiar with uh, um, asking and answering questions and uh, present in and to present things, right? So then we have this. And it is all very simple, right? This is the vocabulary and then the students are going to say all these things. Now, What's really missing in all of that? I mean, other than the whatever, what's really missing in all of this, which seems to be a simple lesson in a load, right? A simple load lesson. Anya, what else would you like us to do? And then at the end, we'll just play a game. And while we're watching television, oh, watch it, it's just words. I like television, right? So this is me, this is uh, my grandmother, and I like television and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, the point is, um, what's missing here is actually the context. The context. You are in a lift and someone says to you, uh, you are in a conference, right? In Indonesia. 
you learn some Indonesian and someone says to you, so, you know, someone important, say professor, says to you, you know, what they say, you know, you've got 30 seconds to say something interesting about yourself, right? So that context will require completely different answers or different structure or different text than, say, in a coffee shop you are with your mates and, you know, with the Indonesian mates and new people and you have to speak Indonesian to them. And what do you say? My name is Anya. I am 77. I am 17 years old. Um, I've got five siblings. I mean, they'll be laughing at you, right? 14 or 17 year old doesn't say, you know, my name is Blah. I've got three brothers, and I like blue color. And I like my favorite television show is. Uh, grill something, whatever his name is, I forgot his name, some, some, some show, right? Nobody talks like that. It's hi, hi. What's your name? What do you answer? Sometimes you say your name and sometimes you say what? What do you think? What, what do you think is best name in Australia? What do you think is most popular name in Australia, hey? And you can play with people, right? So there is this, what, con what the context will be is, is just engaging with people with a bit of in some play. So there are many ways in which you can have your introductory thing. But when we have it this as plain and this as as so called neutral, right? When we remove the context and we create something as arbitrary or something as uh, contextless as this dialogue, what happens is that we did not create a situation enabling students to relate a context to a text. And now the student really doesn't know. Is this the way to talk about yourself in Indonesia? I mean, you know, um, of Vietnam. What happens is that even cultures which seem to be as close as Vietnam, say, and uh, think of something, Cambodia, or as uh, Poland and Germany, you would think, uh, because they're next to each other. In fact, expectations are very different. So someone like me learning Vietnamese, I might think that maybe my peers in Vietnam would require me to because I think that they have a culture of strong family ties and I don't know, whatever, whatever uh, myths and sense and nonsense I heard of about those cultures, right? I would just think, well, this is what you say. This is not true. So what happens is this particular dialogue was not a pathway to learn about, to, to relate the text to the context, it was just a neutral context for me, created for me as a student to learn vocabulary, which I might never use because maybe a professor in a lift where I have to actually in 30 seconds say something important or impressive about myself, that would not work. Or sitting with my peers in a coffee shop, that might not work either. So perfectly good text might actually go nowhere further than just um, a lesson that we prepared for the students. So what I want us to be now aware of, that nobody speaks language. Language is not about words and grammar. Language is not about memorizing particular words so that maybe one day I'll press, on the, press a button in my mind and, and this, some, some of this vocabulary might actually be stored somewhere efficiently enough so that these things will pop out. What I would like a student who created this text, this, this lesson, as well as uh, students in the ECM 251, and also other students who, were create, who created their own lessons in semester one, I want you now to actually consider my points, consider the points that this person on the video makes regarding, re regarding what makes learning efficient, you know, the complexity, the challenge, making things difficult for students, right? giving them tools for them to actually solve problems for themselves, um, but not making things simple in the hope that they somehow simple makes it easier to store and therefore retrieve it in, in some time. In fact, so I want you to actually think about it. And I want you to come back to these ideas of everything is connected, just like in the curriculum, right? Curriculum has many aspects, not just one learning outcome or one, one little objective. Everything is connected in the curriculum and that has to be shown. 
I would like you also to use the modules that we have in our unit and take into consideration what I have spoken about in the last lecture, so two weeks ago, and I recorded it and you have a YouTube link there in the announcements, and take this model and now and I would like you also to explore things that are in the module. So for example, imagine if a student clicked, if we actually, if students, if, if we were in the beginning, so this is the lesson one, right? We're trying to sort of start, um, but start in a complex way and challenging way. So I would like you to actually in the modules to play the different things that you have there where I explain uh, different games, different ways of facilitating explorations of this kind, which then can be used in order for students to actually define a project for themselves and then go through the steps of the project, right? So the exploration phase is actually a phase where we do not tell students what to do, we actually enable, we open up, we open for them a window or, or to load, right? So we, we open the window, we are in a, like a tourism office, as I always say. We open the window and say, oh my God, that's Indonesia, you're kidding me. Yeah, people, what do they do that? They dance, they write books, they write poetry, they have a national anthem, but they also have other songs which are very dear to them. Um, Right, so different ethnic communities, because Indonesia is not just one country, it's just many people. So there are communities, they have their own little poems, their own little ethnic cultures. There, there is a wealth of stuff there, right? So what I would like you to do, to think of ways in which we can make it not only accessible for them, but then also think of tools that we could make available so that students could actually plow through that information and make sense out of it and draw on it in an interesting way so that they could actually on the basis of their exploration then identify in the evaluation which is the second stage right in the evaluation phase they could actually identify a project evaluate what they do evaluation here doesn't mean teacher evaluating students although that happening at the same time but what is what evaluation here actually means is students evaluating their exploration and empowerment stage and identifying a project that they would on the basis of all of that stuff they done here in the engagement they would like to do a project so I often say what if what if you did dare as a teacher to move away from the textbook words and grammar structures to something like the model that I am presenting to you and actually introduce exploration phase. It is not going to be very simple because it requires production of resources and identification of resources and materials and identification of tools and enable students to make sense out of it. But once you've done it, then year in and year out, you can only add to it and make this richer, as I said before. So for example, if students, if you create, I mean, you can, there are many ways of doing this, and I've explained before, right? Like in a, in a, in a lesson, uh, in a lecture one, I was talking about creating a website. So that was, you know, and, and as students actually go through it, you can actually make it bigger and better with them. And we might actually try to focus on it in more detail on two different types of activities. But let me go through this one now, because I've spoken about the website last uh, at the last lecture. So they have a puzzle. These are the, this is the indigenous, uh, the circus is an indigenous symbol, the <clears throat> penguins are just penguins, and the steps here are, are indigenous ways of marking uh, what animals were passing through. And then we have hiragana here for whatever reason. They all, it's about gatherings and meeting friends. But so when students actually, if you did actually, you know, introduce to students, you know, that some, not those pictures, but something more interesting, but under each of these pictures, you have different um, resources. So say you could have under the circle here, you, you could have something about, you know, the things that people do, 
you know, because the, the circles actually in indigenous language that they mean actually gatherings. So you could have things, this is a, you explore in the modules, you know, the video where I talk, I don't know which module, just play, go through the modules until you find something like that. So basically this is the, a video I created about how to use, how to use free resources, free, freely available games, which are online, and how to integrate them into creating a, an amazing game whereby students actually learn a language, explore the village, right? Explore what people do. Uh, so it's about using the ready-made uh, uh, online games in a re repurposing them in a new context and creating out of it an entire learning environment. So imagine they could learn what the villagers do. They could learn also what, we you know, you, this particular game on SAM, which you will find there. So say that uh, someone clicks on the um, person here, there are some children here, they can click on this person here, and this takes them to actually have a look at the games that Sam is playing, and Sam is part of the village. But Sam doesn't have to be part of the village, it's basically under the icon of uh, the group, your students can find this game, this game, and some other game on what people do, right? So I created two, or I don't know what else I have there in the modules, but something. So three games would be great for students. And then an, another thing I have here, what else? So what does it what we have? When friends get together, like you, you could have a different icon here, maybe not the penguins, but something else. So I have here a different theme. So I have... Um, Chinese tales. I have here uh, learning about structuring text differently. So that's a um, that's a uh, PowerPoint created by a student of mine. So she uses uh, the animation of PowerPoint to indicate differences in the way how in English, and you could use it for different languages of your, of, you know, how people actually. Um, organize text differently depending on the genre of a text. So that's so basically this is all about text, right? So this is all about newspaper. This is about differences in the way people structure genres, different genres, and this is about <clears throat> exploring, say, from the cultural perspective, say, the, the traditional tales. And here is the Chinese tales. What else do I have here? Song. Different songs, you could have songs. So I produce a song about the, you know, the Australian sheep. What is it called? Uh, give me a house among the gum trees, right? So you'll find that song somewhere there. You could create a few songs done in this way, which is quite good. So explore the game and uh, have a look whether you could actually repurpose that video, of that, 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 that game in and use it for different songs in your other in your in your in the load that you are teaching so have a few of them so you can see when students click on one or on this one or on the first one or on the second icon or on the third icon you could actually give them access to games uh, and or, that they can actually go through and explore s those games which are themselves activities containing tools for managing information and, and you know they're quite playful and interesting and then engage with them in questions that you will find somewhere in the modules about how to act, how to make sense out of it because first they were just games oh my goodness this is what happens in Indonesia da, da, da. this is what happens this is how they do in Indonesia things and so on and so on and these are the stories and so on so maybe we could actually summarize with them what project we could do to, you know, together. And in order to excite students to a project, because you're a teacher and you're older, you might actually put together resources in such a way that they will give students already some ideas about um, to stimulate them, to inspire them. So some would be something like, you know, presentations by presentations by uh, other students, you know, like what Indonesian students think of different, so the Pecha Kucha like presentations. Another could be students having 
uh, a school website so you could actually take them through activities say say it's no longer chinese stories and so on but it could be different activities that allow your load students to explore a website uh, an indonesian an indonesian website you could actually create it yourself or you could create it with colleagues from indonesia so that they actually can uh, use it with their st students of Indonesia, not of English, and your students enter that website and see amazing things, like, for example, songs in Indonesian or poetry created by Indonesian students of Indonesian. And you could ask me, well, it's going to be difficult to create a poem in Indonesian for my teenagers, right? I mean, my uh, teenager students or our children will not be able to create a poem. I will tell you and I will be teaching you next time we meet that in fact, it is not difficult at all. Your students, if they go through particular explorations through this type of activities, they will be able to create a poem within minutes, definitely within a lesson. So I'm trying to see what's happening in the modules. So you can see that literacy game uh, or ES, load game here is described in module three. And some other ones are here. Um, I can't see the sheep. This is which one? This is 251. Let me go to module four. Where is our sheep story? Uh, it could be somewhere, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll make sure we have it. I can see that 252 has the creating a poem part two, creating a poem part one, and it also has Sam here. So that's good. Um, Sam as well. All right, what I will do also, um, I will include this PowerPoint with the Give Me a Home Among the Gum Trees for you so you can actually um, use, learn how it actually looks like in a PowerPoint and create your own resources with different songs in Vietnamese, in uh, Indonesian, in Chinese using this kind of template so and it's fun and uh, if you have a few then your students can actually in a explore a real song in quite a detail in an interactive way and at the same time learn a lot of cultural information especially if the song is integrated in your lessons in a way that facilitates a cultural learning so I might just leave it for the day today because it's quite a lot of work for you to do to watch that video. I would like you to watch that video on um, how we learn. Right. So I want you to watch it because I want you to start actually shifting your mind in the 21st century. We're no longer into simple. So I would like you to do that. Um, then I would like you to start thinking of the curriculum that things are connected, that they are not about uh, just learning curriculum as if it was a, uh, uh, a list right, of items to study. I would like you to explore resources that are in module two and three so that you can start uh, looking at possibilities that are out there. I will make sure that you have all the games and so on uploaded so that you can actually like even this one Sam playing games uh, that you have it as a template and you can actually use it for your load and I'll make sure that this one is uploaded too so you have some um, some links and so on to, to these resources so you can actually create similar things for yourselves but I want you to actually watch those videos and just start in a start get your brain going about a way of teaching that is resource based that su supports play supports students access to resources 
and tools for information management. There. This is the thing that I always use with my students, and I don't know about load, but I definitely use it with literacy students. It is a very funny lecture. This is a lecture, very famous video um, lecture given by Eleanor, Eleanor, Eleanor Maguire, and she's the person who created uh, created research on London taxi drivers when she found out that. that London taxi drivers have, as they, because they have to learn the complexities of a city, they actually grow parts of their brains bigger, uh, those responsible for memory. And But what they also found out is that people who actually learn, there's a reason why people cannot learn simple things and lists of things and lists of vocabularies, there's a reason why people need complexity. And the reason is that we do not memorize items. As a healthy brain of a human being doesn't memorize items. It actually remembers stories. So we do not construct information. We reconstruct from what we have, we already know. We, we, are, we always reorganize. We never actually acquire new. We reorganize what we know. We reorganize what we know. But what they found out was that if you have amnesia, which is an illness of the brain, these people actually have so-called, they haven't got, we call, let's call it memory, right? Amnesia people don't have memory. What they found out, that they are very good in remembering items. So say a lesson on vocabulary lists in Chinese would be perfect for a person with amnesia. They will remember 17, 20 items. No, nobody normal, nobody healthy can, because that's not how a healthy brain works. But memor memorization of lists of items would be just perfect for people with amnesia, because they have a sick brain, they don't have stories in their head. So all these items are basically memorized as individual separate items. They're not connected and they cannot connect. A person with amnesia, if you give a person with amnesia a croissant, which is a you know French pastry, coffee and newspaper, they will never create a breakfast out of this. They will say, well, that's a coffee, that's a newspaper and that's a coffee table. They will never, ever, ever think that that those items could together make up a context of someone's breakfast. Never. They just can't do it, right? Because complex is not what people with amnesia can do. That's why they're sick. Students and children in schools are not sick. If you give them a way of teaching, which is good for people who are sick, what you do, you actually kill creativity, kill their memory and, and, and brain capacities, and you create people with amnesia. So that's a slide. If you want, you can just read it. And what we will be basically doing next week is how to actually, this is really hard because the screen is very small. It, um, we will be learning next week. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I have to move it. Okay, it's really hard to move it, but I'll try my best, right? So what we will do is to actually learn how to work, how to bring it all together somehow in one piece. So we have all of these things from uh, the curriculum, like communication and understanding, and, and don't read this stuff on the left because it's from somewhere else. And then we have here on the right, we will have... There's another one, I think, reciprocation or so. Oh, yeah, here it is, reciprocating, right? So we've got all of that, reciprocating, uh, communicating and understanding, right? So we've got that from the curriculum. We also have, from so all of this, we will need to learn how to integrate it with priorities and with capabilities. So how can we now go about planning our lessons and integrate all these aspects that are always present when we actually interact in a language, right? So how to integrate all these in planning lessons while at the same time taking account of capabilities and priorities? 
So we will be thinking about that next time and we will be then trying to find ways of what to do with all that, right, in relation to that plan. So it looks complex, but it is actually quite nice because it will allow us to learn two things, how to plan our, uh, our teaching environment, how to plan uh, uh, resources to support that form of teaching, how the same plan can help us to actually assess, how to create challenging, rich um, uh, environments for students, and how to actually start building our own repository of materials. And that's where I want you to start shifting your heads towards. And I certainly want you to forget once for all that language is about learning, itemize bits and pieces, and, they, and it's about memorizing vocabulary in contexts that are non-existing. And as a result, preventing students from exploring themselves in the context of Italian, Indonesian or uh, Arabic, right? We prevent students from exploring their, from exploring their own awarenesses, their own beliefs that themselves in those contexts because we put them in decontextualized uh, environments of vocabulary study, right? For the sake of us, for, uh, for the sake of them actually reproducing them to satisfy us teachers, right? And we will just tick it off and say, done. I want us to move away from it. And I'm very happy for my students in load to actually create not necessarily very good lessons, but at least I can see that there is some risk taking happening and starting to actually do some planning in a way that is truthful or aligns with the curriculum and as a result supports students' uh, cultural, personal, social and critical transformation and that's what we're after, okay? So this was a long class but I hope that, that sort of put some things together in your head and oriented you to what to do over the next two weeks so that we can then start summarizing all of that into something like a planning and identifying a bit more precisely what to do with all of that inside of our plan. Okay, so, so far so good from me. And I see you in two weeks.